Yeah, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. T.C. Yang from the uh, Naval Research Lab. Um, Dr. Yang uh, received his, uh, he did his undergraduate study uh, in physics uh, in Taiwan. Um, then he received uh, a PhD um, from University of Rochester in high energy physics. Um, since then, he uh, did uh, eight years of uh, research in various universities. Then in uh, 1979, which was a while ago, he uh, joined the Naval Research Lab. Uh, <clears throat> so he has acted as the branch head of the signal processing branch for the last five years, and he's now a senior scientist and consultant in the acoustic uh, division. His main research interest is in underwater acoustic and acoustic oceanographic related research. He has also worked on sonar signal processing. Um, so for the last 10 years, his research is concentrated on environmental impact on underwater acoustic communication. Uh, he's a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. Um, so I'd like to thank him for uh, coming to visit. And also, I'd like to give a special thanks for his uh, strong support on our research on underwater acoustic communication here at the University of Utah. Uh, in this past summer, he uh, offered to help us transmit some signals for free at his at sea experiments. So we are able to use those data collected from the experiments to test uh, our algorithms. So we are very grateful for his uh, support. Okay, so without further ado, let's give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Professor Chen and Professor Farang for inviting me here to give this talk and for show, showing me your beautiful campus. The subject of my talk is uh, underwater acoustic communications, channel physics, and the implication for signal processing. Underwater Acoustic communication is a subject that has gained great interest in the last 15 years because of some technology breakthrough. It, one will not be exaggerated to say that it's the beginning of a new industry because the sea is very important to our livelihood. So why underwater acoustic communications? There are two aspects to this problem. Why underwater communications and why acoustic communications? Underwater communication, the purpose is to transmit information from under the water to above the water because we need to collect a lot of information under the water, under the sea. And why acoustic communications? Basically because radio frequency and optical communication does not travel very far. If you have swim in the ocean, you know you can't see very far. And particularly when the water is muddy, you practically cannot see the person next to you. So when you use acoustics, just like marine mammals, they use acoustics. They don't use the light. They don't see each other, but they hear each other. There are various applications for acoustic communications, such as offshore oil drilling, pollution monitoring, ocean climate monitoring, ocean seismic monitoring, and, and recently the autonomous underwater vehicles. You probably all know about the remotely operated vehicles that used to find uh, the Titanic, where you have uh, big machines with uh, big cables, and that serves the purpose very well. You get a very good picture of the ship when the water is clear on, and when you get close to the water. But when, but when the water is muddy, you can't see anything. Acoustic has been used to, de uh, can find subject at a much longer distance than using light. And that's used, uh, you know, by, for example, by the Navy, 
to, to, to find a mine in the ocean bottom, for example. Now, with autonomous underwater vehicles, these are vehicles like torpedo shapes. They, can, they move around in the oceans autonomously without a human being control it. They serve as a force multipliers. If you have many of them, you can send them out. They can find the shipwreck. They can find another Titanic. With the Titanic, with the ROV, you have to have a dedicated ship. The cable, the ship costs a lot of money. A typical ship costs $30,000 a day to operate. And the vehicle costs a lot of money. The cable costs hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars a foot versus the cable you use in the house, which a dollar can buy many, many foot. So, with, so you have a limited ability to find a ship because you can only operate in a small area. The, with AUVs, they serve as a multi, force multiplier because you can, they are cheap to produce. They can go around. They can, they can do a lot of things that you cannot do. It opens a new horizon. The same thing with ocean climate monitoring. You all know, probably heard of El Nino, which changed our weather pattern just dramatically. Currently, don't was deployed thousands of buoys to find out the ocean temperature. But thousands of buoy is small for such a big oceans. And you use cable to transmit the data from under the water to but if you have underwater acoustic communication, you can just, and you take a ship to deploy it. Now, you, you have a wireless modem, you can just fire an airplane and, de and de deploy them easily. And you can deploy thousands of them, or tens of thousands of them. That opens, and you collect much, much more data than you currently possible. So, now for the navies, the same thing. It opens the, the door for many things you cannot do before. This is a picture of a future Navy warfare concept that one would de deploy sensor node on the ocean bottoms, many of them, to, de to detect an uh, enemy submarine and send the information back using acoustic communication between no, back to your own submarine and back to your home base. Now with many of them, using cable just not possible. And, you, and the Navy wants to deploy them in a particular area of interest. Cable takes weeks to deploy and uh, lots of money. So this is, it's what's called a network-centric warfare for the Navy. And for all these things, one needs underwater acoustic communications. Now, some of you know what's the problem with the communication. The basic problem is inter-symbol interferences. If you speak in a reverberant room, you say, I, you, the, the other person will hear, I, 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 I. So before, you have to speak very slowly. Otherwise, the other person cannot hear what you want to say. But you want to say, I want to tell you something. Then all of this got gobbled. And that's the inter symbol interferences. I show you pictorially your symbols. At the first time, time one, you send a square, and square is a reverberate with multi-pass arrival. And they encounter phase change, which I represent by, by rotations. At time two, you send a triangle and enter goes phase change and the multi-pass arrival. So at the receiver, the first time you, re you see a square, you can identify it. But the second time is the summation of these two figures. You cannot tell what's the symbol. So this inter symbol interference is the basic problem of uh, communications. But you say, well, 
in RF communication, you also have inter-symbol interferences. Then why can't we take the, what's already been developed in the RF communication and apply to end waters? Then what, one actually has tried that and find that in many cases, it doesn't work. One, therefore, ask, what's the, what's the difference between the RF channel and the underwater channel? And that's basically what I want to give you some idea about it. First, the underwater channel is severely bandwidth limited. In RF, you can assign different users different bandwidths. So there's no problem. And that's because the sound is attenuated by seawater and by ocean bottoms. Second, the sound arrives with uh, many multipasses and cause significant, with delay spread, can cover hundreds of symbols. Very long echo, in other words, very long echo, echoes, very difficult to remove. The, other, the third is the channel, underwater channel, is time varying. You know, basically, you have a rough surface. You have a lot of uh, things happening in, in, under the water. The sound scatter from the surface and the ocean mediums produce a lot of uh, time varying properties and making the channel tracking very difficult. The last is not the least, but is the, the Doppler ratio, shift ratio. The Doppler shift over the carrier frequency is several orders higher than, than in the RF channels. And one has to correct for those large Doppler shifts, otherwise simple synchronization has error and difficult. So I will just go through, give you some examples of each, and talk about each item and give you some examples. First, talk about extensive multipass arrival. This gives you a picture of how sound travel in deep water. Sound traveling is dependent by the sound speed. Sound speed is a function of the temperature and the pressure. Near the surface, the temperature is higher and the sound speed is higher. Near the bottom, the pressure is higher and therefore the sound speed is higher. And the sound does not go by a straight line. It's bended by the sound speed. So if you have a source here, the sound is bended by, it travels deep into the almost near the ocean bottom, then come back, then keep going, and become dispersive. Uh, later, they spread out. So at each point, you can see there are many multi-pass arrivals. Now in shallow water, which is even worse, you can see that uh, there are so many rays possible and they interact the ocean bottoms. So the, the bottom make, make a lot of difference in, in determining what's the property of the sound at the receivers. If the ocean is stable, we can calculate the, the multipass then we can predict and we can, we can remove it. That's not a problem. The problem is ocean is, is varying with time. Now, this picture shows the actual measurement of sound speed in water near the New Jersey. The sound speed is represented by color. Blue is low and red is high. The sound speed is high here because the Gulf Stream coming up from Florida introduced a higher warm water, and the sound speed here is basically Arctic water coming down. And you can see that the sound speed varies with the location, varies with the depth, and the most of all, this is not a stable picture. It changes quite a bit. Depends on today, the Gulf Stream is is here, tomorrow the Gulf Stream can move in, and one can, it's not possible to predict. Nobody today can predict where the Gulf Stream will move. 
or, and on top of that shows that uh, what's called the internal waves. By the, this, you can see these white lines. These are, are, are waves inside the water column. It's similar to the wave on the surface, but actually is inside the water column. And they change the sound speed, and they move around, and also not easy to predict. This internal wave has a surface expression you can actually see from the radar. You can see those internal waves. And these are the, the, picture, the sound speed under the water corresponding to those front that's being measured. And they, this covers you know, probably one kilometer or, or range, and the separation is around you know, 30 kilometers. And they are there, like in the in the from from May to to September, they are there all the time, every day, almost. And the sound speed can change in a matter of days because, of like Gulf Stream, for example, Gulf Stream moves in. What Matt, in this case, that's the recent experiment. This, you put the source here, in this sound speed, you find the impulse response is very short. Echo is short. But next, a few days later, you have this sound speed, and uh, we happen to collect data using source here. You find that the echo is much longer. Impulse response is now two through three times longer. So the picture is that uh, the ocean changes quite a bit, and they are different from one place to the other place, and they are not different predictable, and we don't have enough sensor to, 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 to collect the data. And so this shows that the, the sound speed variation, spectral density, has many scales, time scales, you know, due to various different processes. So at what time scale does that affect underwater acoustic communications. That's one of the issues. One wants to know which process is important. It all depends on what, at what frequency you want to do the things. So, so we talked about multi-pass arrival, time varying channel. Now we talk about the bandwidth. Now, to find out the bandwidth, theoretically, one will use the, the Shannon's water filling formula, which basically shows the inverse of the signal to noise ratio at the, at the re receiver. And you just, the, it's called the water filling. Basically, you, you fill this well with water until, until the area equal to the power you're going to transmit. Now, what happens is that at the 20 kilometer, at the two kilometers, you see, you have a quite a, band, a large bandwidth to use. At the short range, you have a large, large bandwidth to use. At the long range, you have a sh smaller bandwidth to use. This is a, using a propagation model, which take care of uh, improve the exact condition. Intuitively, you can also have a simple picture just using sonar equation plus the signal SNR at different ranges. So at 100 kilometers, you want to take advantage of the, the area where the SNR is high. So that gives you the bandwidth you want to use. At the five kilometer, you have a large bandwidth. At the 100 kilometers, I mean, you have a smaller bandwidth. That's one thing. The other thing is that the long range, you have to use lower carrier frequency, like a, a few kilohertz. At the short range, you want to use a higher carrier frequency. So that's the basic lesson you, you, you learn from this exercise. And this is confirmed with real data. In real data, one finds that the, the carrier frequency goes like 
inverse square root of the range. And that's basically the rule of thumb you want to use. How do you select the free carrier frequency? Okay. And the data array goes to like a inverse of the range. So at the short range, you can have a high data array. At the long range, you have to use, you, ha you are limited to a very, very small data array because of your limited bandwidth. So using the, the, sh the water filling formula, one can calculate the channel for capacity, which basically means the, in this channel, what's the maximum data rate one can achieve? It's limited by the, by the channel, not, and that's been calculated using this one. Now, in practice, you don't have uh, all the bands that allow by, by Shannon's the formula because the, the, you have a constraint. Your, your hardware, your source, cannot transmit such a high bandwidth signal. And from that, you deduce the, the date, maximum data rate as a function of a range is given by this curve. However, from all the at C experiment, you find the maximum data rate, this curve, is 40 kilometer times kilobits per second. This curve is orders of magnitude than what's theoretically possible. So many wonders, what's the reason? Why can't we achieve this maximum data rate? In the RF world, your maximum data rate is very close to the, the theoretical maximum, but in underwater, it's order of magnitude. And so that's a, a, a significant issue for research but, you know, there is no real regulars explaining except empirical findings. So, to summarize, the characters of the underwater channel are the limited bandwidth, low frequency. You use low frequency for long ranges and you use high frequency to for short ranges. 10 kilometers, 10 kilohertz can go 10 kilometers. 25 hertz can go around the world, no problem. 75, 75 hertz can go half around the world. Whales in the northern hemisphere can communicate to whales in the southern hem, hem, hemisphere because they use very low frequency sound. There's no typical underwater channels. Because of the time varying property signal level, the rate of fluctuation, the spread, the amplitude, and the phase, they're all highly variable and not predictable. And in some channel, coherence time is very short because of the various ocean process going on under the water. What's one of the reasons for high data array communication, there, is, there has not been a commercial underwater modem. All the modems are low data array. Now, we talk about, for communication, there are two elements. One is data array, the other is bit array. We talk about the maximum data array and the achievable data array. Then we talk, next, we talk about the bit array. The problem of bit array is not, for all the currently used algorithm is not, they are not robust. You cannot say, I transmitted a few packages that have zero bit error. The question is, if you transmit, does that, do you achieve zero bit error every time you transmit? The, the state of R is only 30% of the time, 30, 40% of the time. The rest, you have a high bit error. And one asks why? And that's, well, basically, that's because of the time varying properties. You know, arrival time, amplitude in the phase. There are just too many of degree of freedom. And with short coherence time, you have only limited the data to estimate. So your degree of freedom of the data 
is comparable to the degree of freedom in the ocean, and that made the estimation a difficult problem. So, and that's another reason. You, for a commercial modems, you ha has, when you drop in the water, it has to work, whatever the channel condition it is. And if you cannot, you do not have a model to adequately estimate the performance, then you are going, the modem will not work many of the times. So, given this uh, background, how do we approach underwater acoustic communications? I know you are all working on signal processing, but in underwater acoustics, we also take into consideration the channel physics. And there are three approaches. Physics approach, signal processing approach, and the information theory approach, they can be independent and they don't need each other. One will work given an adequate condition. This physics says that given a long vertical array, long vertical array that covers the water columns, the Huygens principle will dictate that you can communicate without inter simple interference. But the example is time reversal, but in reality, a practical system has a very short aperture. So I show you this uh, because you might have a physics course where you learn the, the Huygens principle from optics, where it says that if the line is transmitted from here to a receiver going through a diffraction gradient, to receive the signal is the same as if the light is coming from individual sources with its power. So, so the green function from X1 to Xn is the source level at this position, and the propagation from this point to this point is by, given by Xn to S2. So this is basically the Huygens principle. Now, we flip around. We move this to this side. And change variables, change the order variable from xn to 2 to x2n. You find that now the green function from x2, x1 to x2 is basically a delta function because they are basically closing each other. So, and you can communicate from x1 to x2, no problem, because it's right next to each other. Now, in physics, means, this means you send a signal to this receiver, and you time reverse the signal back. The signal will all back, travel back and focus to x2. And that's the principle of time reversal. If you time reversal and send it back, it will all go back to the original point in the focus. Now, this is active time reversal. Now, in, for communication, we we'll do this time reversal in computer. We don't do that in, in actual communications. Yeah, the, the, the other approach you are more familiar with is the signal processing. For a slowly varying ch channels, one can track the channel, and then we can adaptively correct for the channel, and one will expect you will have error-free signal. The problem is that whenever there's a little error, the error feedback in the decision feedback equalizer and the, the processor stops. And the other approach is using information series that Shannon says that you can send a well-designed code, a long code, and you can get a signal by decoding. You don't have to, you know, given enough knowledge, you don't need to do any signal processing. But you need a long time. You need a lot of energy processing. And that's applied in, in, by some people, for example, in OFDM, where you do not need to track the channel. Each OFDM block is independent of the other. You only have to estimate channel approximately, 
And if you can achieve 10 to the minus 1 bit errors, then using the powerful code, LDPC, low density parity code, you can remove the errors. Or you can do that for turbo equalizer using block with, with training data. You know, this is another approach. I do not need to track the channel because we know that it's difficult. But if we have some advanced knowledge, we just rely on decoding to get to get the signal back. Now, our approach is that we take the advantage of the three for the pers the purpose to achieve robustness. And I, I will, I will, the rest of the talk, I will try to show you how we achieve a robustness. What we do is that we use the passive phase conjugation, passive time reversal or time reversal in the computer. We remove the interference, intersymbol interference for some you know, deterministic or dominant arrivals. We use time reversal. We use physics to remove the interference of the, well, the predictable arrivals. Then, then we have, after that, we have some residual interference due to the arrival we cannot predict. And we re remove that using decision feedback equalizer. Uh, for rapidly varying channels, we estimate a ch channel impulse response iteratively or recursively, and we can march through. And the result is that we can achieve 10 to the minus 2 and code the bit error rate in practically all the water we have tested, and then we can remove the residual bit array using a high efficiency encoder. So this is the, the, the block diagram of how, how our processor works. We have a you know, receiver, a, a vertical array, for example, of six receivers. The, the data received, this, this, is, this, this is the channel, this is the received data, is a match filter with the estimated channel impulse response. You convolute with the estimated channel is response, which give you the correlation of the two. And then you sum all of the channels. And the, and the, the correlation of the channel impulse response sum over channel, and we call that the Q function. It's like a Q of a resonance. You, that's why it's called Q functions. Then this is removed by a decision feedback equalizer. So this can be equivalent to express by a single channel with a channel impulse response given by the Q function, then removed by the decision feedback equalizer. Uh, it has a very simple analytic form Everything is expressed into the Q functions. So the Q function is not the original impulse response. Now, as a, why do we use this? We call it correlation-based equalizer because the impulse the effect, effective impulse response of the Q function is the correlation of the original impulse response. First of all, this passive phase conjugation is a linear equalizer, and PPC plus, plus DFE is a redundant. You only need one equalizer. We use two equalizers. We use, instead of a, one step equalization, we use two step of equalizations for the purpose of achieving robustness. For a large VOA, the Q function is independent of the environment. Whether in shallow water, 50 meters, with the long multipass, 
or another shallow water, 100 meters, 200 meters, with very short multipath spread. They all have the Q, same Q functions. It's a, it has a universal property. Based on that, we find that uh, for a small aperture arrays, we can make the, the Q function can be made approximately universal if we, by a proper array designs. As a result, we can have, have a modem which use the same number of tap coefficients because now the Q function is universal, is the same for all the oceans. We can use the same number of tap coefficients for all the shallow water, for all the environment. And that can pave for the way for a commercial modem. And that's what we are developing uh, right now. And because the performance is a function of the Q function, as I indicated in previous slide, is not, independent, is not a function of the individual original impulse response. We can, pre we can model the performance under different environment. This, I won't go through it, basically shows that uh, in the water channel, the Q function is, is a sink function in the time domain. So it's a high main lobe and a very slow side lobe. Okay, give you some examples. Uh, this is at uh, the 3.5 kilohertz. In various uh, experiments, these are some are in the Mediterranean, some are in, like in this in New England. See, one, this is depth, this is a delay spread. In this case, you have a short delay spread. In this case, you have a long delay spread. The arrival is sparse in this case. The arrival is almost continuous in this case. So if you have a sparse estimator, you will miss all the other arrivals. All these environments in different waters have the same Q functions. I'll show you a picture of the Q functions. Uh, have on the other one. Let me see. You are, okay. This is the picture of the Q functions. It's a sink function plus the uh, other side lobes. Now, that covers different areas. Now, what are, now we talk about in a particular area, you have a time varying channel. See, the channel, in some channel, is relatively stable. You get bay environment until something happens. But in other channel, when you have a rough seas compared with calm seas, see, you have many, many more scattered returns. See, this is more or less consistent. These arrival time are random and not predictable. And in, in an open oceans where you have a lot of uh, an internal waves, the impulse response are not continuous. And they, they are intermittent and difficult, difficult for adapt equalizer to track. And they have different coherence time. This has a very long coherence time. You can estimate the channel reliably. This has a very short coherence time. You have only this much data to, to estimate the channel. The same thing for the, the rough surface versus the calm surface. See, the arrival is almost, it is broken up. This arrival is gone because uh, the surface uh, sent it to somewhere else. And the coherence time is, is short. But despite the time variations, they all have the same Q functions. And this shows the, if you normalize Q function to, to one, they, are, they, they all look like this. The value is basically the source level, effective source level modulated by the ocean. But that, the level is not important for phase shift keying. So this is the idea we use that we based on this Q, 
that all channels have the same Q function, therefore we can remove, we can equalize the rest residual due to the silo using decision feedback equalizer for all the oceans. Now, we can also model it, uh, uh, the, the performance. We can use uh, upper SNR or better arrays. Let me use upper SNR one. And this upper SNR is a function of the number of receivers. So it, it will go up with the number of receivers. For a channel is time invariant, you have a high performance. But if, if the channel loses the coherence, because of uh, various reasons, then you all know that the performance will degrade. So we can look, well, one would like to have uh, such a surface, then you can predict your model, modern performance, but we can only have some snapshot of this performance surface. So this plot, uh, the, the output SNR as a number of receivers for various uh, different environments. Different environment can be plotted on the same surface because they, whenever, whenever they have the same Q functions. So this is the result. For different environment, for various different environment, for various frequencies, the output in the NR follows this the same similar curve. And that's given by, by the number of uh, effective element which is given for closely spaced form is given by the aperture divided by the coherence length. For largely spaced form is the number of phones. And that's 10 log n e, there's a subscript here. And we can see that for different environment, one can, they follow the same, the trend, the same curve as we have um, uh, modeled the uh, or semi-theoretically. Now, now we look at uh, uh, this curve. Now, ideally, we will want model this curve in terms of coherence time, but the coherence time is difficult to estimate from data. Now, we find a practical way to estimate, to as a metric, a practical way to a practical, we use, we use channel estimation error as a metric to, to, for practically predicting the performance. We find that the output SNR is a function of the channel estimation error. For some environment, the channel estimation is uh, high because the residual of the Q function is high, the silo of the Q function is high, and for, for stable environment, the residual of the, the silo of Q function is low, and that gives you a low channel estimation error, and they more or less follow a straight line. And this is a yes, simulation result. Now, assuming this result, we only have a limited data because element experiments are hard to, to do. Assuming this hypothesis is correct, that means for any other oceans, you give me a snap of shot of data, I can estimate the channel estimation error very easily. I need, don't need much of data. Then I can predict the performance of this time reversal based equalizer in that ocean. So, so this serves as a practical, practical tool for, for for performance estimations. And so this one is shows this curve. That means if I want to achieve certain performance, what, how many number of receivers I will need to achieve that for different environment. For some environment, I only need one or two receivers. For other environment, I will need many receivers. So this tell me how many receivers I need for a particular environment. Again, that's a, 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 for practical purpose, it's useful for, for um, system design. 
So what we have done so far is just, you know, identify the critical environmental and performance parameters. For, so from a practical point of view, provide uh, some assessment of the performance. And, uh, and uh, we developed this uh, uh, Q-based uh, equalizers. And we have done experiment in, in, in many places all over the world. And, uh, and in doing so, we have de developed a, a lot of at sea equipment that's uh, unique in the world. Not only unique in the whole world, but also unique in the, in the US. That uh, these equipment are very expensive. And uh, basically, and I all have spent uh, like a, a, a one and a half million dollars. So I sh show you some of the equipment. This basically we we call the, the ACDS, which is a acoustic communication data storage buoys, and a, a acoustic source receiver arrays. So for the ACDS, we have two set of arrays. Each one have uh, eight receivers, has one projector, and they can be deployed from the ocean bottom and with uh, RF that we can do real-time monitoring. And so in one experiment, we deploy two of them, one near the ocean bottom, one near the surface, we have a source receiver array with 12 channels, 12 transmitter, 12 receivers. These systems, you know, cost the, the like $400,000 uh, each. And these are the systems. They are big because uh, they have to stand the, the, the destruction. The ocean has a very high destruction power. You think a steel cable of the size of almost small fingers is very strong, but they are broken by the ocean. They are, the wave has such strong, and the cable, in the, if, if it's not standard steel, you live in the water, they are eaten out by the, by the marine germs. So, and so these are the equipment we deploy. So, that, that, so we have developed this correlation-based equalizer, and uh, we have uh, demonstrated uh, high reliabilities. And also for data for mid frequency and high frequencies and uh, others. Now we're currently doing uh, MIMO communications. So. How much time are we almost close to? Hmm? So with that, I will just, uh, I, will, I, I will not, because it will, this take a while to go into the MIMO communication. I will just uh, finish here and uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, I have a, like, how much interference do you see like from you know, like whales or things like that, you know, uh, you know sounds that happen. I mean, there's going to okay. be... Whales uh, operate at uh, very low frequency. Okay. You know, 100 hertz or below. Okay. And a lot of... It's not a lot dolphins? Of, huh? <laughs> dolphins is also below one kilohertz. Around, around that. Or, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> we are, we are, we are oper I mean, operating like uh, at least uh, several kilohertz to okay. tens of kilohertz. We have, uh, uh, for, for some of you, you may find it very interesting. What the interference source is from shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you know, there's one kind of shrimp called the snapping shrimp. It has a big thumb, right? It will, it will click, click, click. You know, this, they have two jars, right? They have a big, one big jar to, to snap. 
as well producing a very loud clap. And this is that's the main interference zone. <laughs> It's because there are, there are thousands of them, I mean, hundreds of thousands of them. That's the... Hmm. So eat more shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you made a fish fight. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, yeah, so I'm assuming that uh, you transmit and receive using like a transducer array. Right. right? Um, so since you've got all these elements in an array, can you use that to do like beam forming and things like that to, yes. to ignore sounds coming from certain directions and that allows you to get a better signal? Yes, beam forming is, uh, is one approach, but it only works when the multipaths uh, are very close range when you, you can eat, separate the multipaths in angles, right? You need angle resolution to separate the multipaths. At the short ranges, the, they arrive at the angle we will we, we'll separate, so you can beamform and eliminate the other. Right. At the long ranges, they are the, they will arrive very close angles, right. and yeah. you don't have the resolution to separate them. In that case, the beamforming doesn't work very well. The, instead, you use spatial diversity. You rely on, on the signal being very different on different receivers. So th these are two different approaches. Right. Can you also rely on like how attenuated the signal is? Like you could send out a pulse and listen for the reflection, and if it's attenuated a lot, you know how far away it is. Uh, in principle, you can, but uh, in practice, there's a lot of uncertainty because the bottom is, is uh, also t range dependent. Right. So they, you you cannot you know you think they give you this much attenuation, but uh, but you cannot project for the next range because the bottom changes. 